Hey guys, it's Cam from Craft and Tailored. In this episode of What Is On My Wrist, we're talking about the Patek Philippe Nautilus Reference 3700, the OG, the precursor to the most popular watch, I think, on the market right now, which is uh, the Patek Philippe uh, 5711. Nautilus, which is basically the modern reincarnation of this watch here. So we recently uh, published an article about the design and uh, the history behind the Patek Philippe Nautilus. Um, and we talked about the 3700 and how that kind of evolved into the 5711 and why that was an icon. And we also talked about Gerald Genta in that article, um, who is considered by most, even by myself, to be one of the uh, best uh, watch designers of our generation, meaning that he created some of the most iconic designs of uh, you know the the modern within the modern world. So um, really interesting guy. But we uh, did an article that talks about um, the Nautilus and kind of the design history and heritage and kind of idea behind um, this watch. Um, the Nautilus uh, in modern times has become definitely an icon and kind of a staple within the serious collector's watch box, whether it be a 3700 or a 3800 or a 5711. Um, the there's uh, so many different versions of the Nautilus and I wanted to take a moment to kind of highlight that article because I think it is really important, you know, kind of a good entry point into understanding the reference range, but also I got my hands on a really incredible uh, 3700 and it is a good case study for the reference and so I wanted to kind of highlight this watch talk a little bit about it but also um, kind of use this as a way to you know talk about the Nautilus as a whole and being that we're you know a, a vintage watch dealer um, the 3700 range of watches are getting increasingly harder and harder to find so the fact that we have a good one um, that is very much complete, um, I think warranted a video. So let's dive into the into the details. So um, if you know Gerald Genta, Genta is, is responsible for designing, I think two of uh, the most iconic and most interesting watches that uh, have come out of, uh, you know, Switzerland uh, probably in the last 100 years. And you can, type in the comments and argue with me that no, like they're, they're whatever, whatever. But I think that um, if we look at Gerald Genta and his design of the Royal Oak and then the Nautilus and some of these other, you know, watches, um, he was very controversial in his, in his initial approach. And that uh, feeling and that design uh, kind of take uh, ultimately became very iconic, even to the point where there are other brands that are really now imitating kind of his designs, which were initially very much controversial. Um, in 1972, Genta uh, partnered with Audemars Piguet to uh, create the Royal Oak um, with the release of the 5402. And um, we've done a couple of videos on the 5402. I'll provide some links in the description. Uh, description below or above here so that you can check those out. But um, really interesting watch. Again, in 1972, um, you know, was very controversial to produce an oversized watch that was very thin, that was, you know, essentially time only with a date complication. And, uh, you know, again, ultimately that watch has become, you know, an icon. Uh, fast forward to, you know, 1976, uh, Gerald Genta is working with uh, Patek Philippe and he comes up with the Nautilus. The 3700 is, is similar in design to the uh, 5402, but it's kind of, I guess, a refinement of, of the design. The watches are very similar. To me, the Royal Oak is very, like, almost like, uh, you know, kind of hard in design. It's, it's very angular, it's very modern, it's very, uh, you know, kind of edgy, whereas the Nautilus is very much more paddock and design where it's soft, it's much more refined, you know, it, it's still very much modern, but ultimately it um, is, I think, kind of a refinement of the initial design of uh, the AP5402. So we can wax on and go over that in, in, in gross detail, and we've got a couple of great articles that, that do that, but uh, for sake of discussion and kind of talking about the Nautilus and the 3700, um, wanted to um, kind of maybe jump back into, into the details of, of this watch and the 3700. Genta's initial design idea 
uh, inspiration actually came from the porthole of a ship complete with uh, these ears. So if you look at the side of a, of, you know, a Nautilus, you basically have kind of these ears and the ideas that those two ears on the side of, of the case were kind of where you would open the, open a ship's porthole. So if you look at a ship's porthole, the, uh, you know, case, uh, or I guess the head of the watch really kind of resembles that porthole of, of a ship. What's interesting about the Royal Oak and the Nautilus is they both take a nautical inspiration. So the, uh, Royal Oak was named after, you know, uh, the eight uh, Royal Oak class of uh, battleships from uh, the British Royal Navy. Um, and it also resembles a, a diver's helmet, whereas the Nautilus um, kind of resembles, again, a, more of a porthole. Um, and, you know, I guess isn't really nautical themed, but also if I think back to like uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I kind of get like this Jules Verne kind of vibe when I look at a Nautilus always and instantly. So very interesting kind of design inspiration behind Genta having two iconic watches, but ultimately having them be kind of tied to the ocean and or nautical kind of, uh, kind of themed, which is really interesting. Um, like the Royal Oak as well, the Nautilus and the Royal Oak uh, both incorporate an integrated bracelet, which I think is kind of interesting for the time. So most steel and or gold sport watches um, from the early to mid 1970s had removable bracelets and a much more traditional case uh, type of design, whereas both the Royal Oak and the Nautilus uh, being the 3700 initially um, in incorporated these integrated bracelets. Um, Again, the Royal Oak is definitely more angular and has a bezel with exposed screws. The Nautilus offers a more rounded case with a flat and or smooth bezel for kind of a more uh, elegant and refined overall package fit, feel and finish. We were kind of talking about that. I think that, that the Nautilus was kind of a, a refinement of Genta's idea and or design inspiration. Calling the design the Nautilus uh, better than the Royal Oak is not really that accurate as aesthetics are ultimately a matter of personal taste. Additionally, among you know the watch enthusiast crowd, you'll likely find just as many fans of the Royal Oak as you will the Nautilus, possibly even more. Um, and I think that that's kind of interesting. I like both of the watches kind of you independently. Um, if, I'm, if I'm being a watch snob as I can be uh, on occasion, I actually like the Royal Oak a little bit more um, I just kind of like that edgier, kind of more angular design, whereas uh, the Nautilus, uh, I'm not complaining, uh, but uh, definitely has much more kind of a smooth and or refined kind of feel. They're just different, but I think you uh, very rarely will find people that like them both. I think you, you know, you'll find a collector that likes one versus the other more so, and it's just kind of, you know, a different design language altogether. So let's talk a little bit about some of the key elements of the watch um, in terms of kind of like fit, form, finish, how it wears. Let's talk about the dial, let's talk about the hands. Uh, and then we'll, we're actually gonna talk about some um, really interesting, uh, you know, kind of elements that um, differentiate it from the Royal Oak, but kind of make it its own thing. Um, one, I think that uh, Patek Philippe uh, generally speaking is a much more refined and much more luxurious brand than uh, Audemars Piguet. Um, I think that they're pretty much on par with the level of manufacturing and things like that, but um, Patek Philippe definitely has been known to produce some of the most elegant and prestigious watches from a horological perspective uh, ever. And the price points definitely show that in auctions, whether it be a uh, uh, you know, a complicated watch or, uh, you know, uh, uh, a minute repeater or whatever, you know, Patek is just uh, kind of in their, in their own league. But I think from a fit form finish perspective, um, if you compare Audemars Piguet to uh, Patek Philippe, um, there's a lot of similarity and they're both insanely high quality. The other thing that's interesting that the Nautilus shares with the Royal Oak, and I don't wanna keep just comparing this you know, to the Royal Oak, but I think that that is ultimately, people want to compare the two because they are very similar, but ultimately uh, you know, different. Um, the case size of the 3700 is 42 millimeters and also you know it kind of shares that with the royal oak and being that both of the watches within the 70s were 
uh, essentially oversized sport watches for their for their time period. And the cool thing about this, from a from kind of a wearability perspective, is like uh, you know the watch wears very thin. Um, the thirty seven hundred, um, you know, is is powered by uh, the the Paddock caliber twenty eight dash two five five C, and that movement, um, the twenty eight dash two five five C. Um, it, it essentially it, it was and still is one of the thinnest self-winding uh, movements uh, that was created. There's actually thinner movements now that are that are automatic, but for a long time the 28255C uh, was one of the thinnest full rotor self-winding movements in the entire world. Really, really thin. So that's another interesting kind of design characteristic of the watch is that when it's on the wrist. It is very thin. This watch fits under like a shirt sleeve very nicely, but um, also in wearing it, it it feels elegant, but also not very serious. And and what I mean by that is it it doesn't strike me as like a luxury dress piece. It it, it is a very versatile piece from the perspective of you could for sure wear this with with a suit, um, and you could wear this in a very casual setting. And the watch kind of can transform to. Uh, meet that kind of occasion uh, effort, effortlessly. Um, the one thing that I really love about the watch is the dial. So you have, uh, you, you know, in the 3700 series, uh, this amazing kind of blue dial with like these, uh, I guess, kind of like ridges that go across the dial. Um, and the other thing too is the hands are these basically like baton style hands with these, uh, you know, um, I guess you could call them like luminous filled uh, baton type markers or uh, um, uh, what would you call that? Like stick kind of markers, but they're luminous filled. Um, the hands and the dial and the way that everything is put together just works really, really, you know, stunningly together. I don't know if that's the right word or that's how you should say it, stunningly, but it's, it's elegant and handsome at the same time. And what I mean by that is it's not it's not a delicate watch, but it's also not like overly like hard in its design traits and it's and it's, you know, kind of perfectly balanced in the middle, which is I think what a lot of people like about the watch. Um, this is an, an exceptional example. This watch actually remains unpolished, which is kind of rare. Um, it's rare within the vintage watch world to find a watch like this that is unpolished because uh, you know, these watches ultimately over the years in some cases can be mistreated or you know, they were uh, just buffed at some point during their service intervals and things like that. So to find an example that remains this sharp and intact um, is very, very hard to do. One flaw within the within the early 3700s and same thing with like the early 5402s is that the, the dial lacquer itself was very thin. So the blue and gray lacquers that were used between uh, the 3700 paddocks and the 5402 APs was very thin, so it's uh, prone to tropicalization and or lifting off the dial, which in some cases can create like a really cool look. We actually had a very early 3700 that had um, this like almost kind of like starbursty kind of look to it. And that's where like the lacquer had kind of degraded on the dial. Um, so to find an original uh, dial that is, you know, almost in immaculate condition is pretty hard to do. This one is pretty close. This is probably like a 9.8 out of 10 on the dial. The hands are, uh, you know, in stunning condition. The markers are in, in, in perfect condition. There's some peeling and kind of some, you know, brassing happening with, with the dial, but it's something that I actually look for um, in these watches because it's very prone and common to have that have that happen. So this is just a, a case study example. We'll provide a link in the description below so that you can check out, you know, pictures. I mean, original fold over, over clasp, right? I mean, an amazing, example altogether that remains just unpolished. And the thing that is is cool about these as well is that the finishing details of this watch, you know, when you really look at this watch and you really look at like, you know, the polishing and the brushing and the manufacturing elements of it, it's, it's a work of art in itself. Uh, and that's, you know, something that is just awesome. So I love this dial, love the watch. Um, this is a very, very awesome example and we'll provide some close-ups of of this watch to be kind of referenced as really a case study for what a 3700 that you know remains unpolished should should look like. Furthermore, we have some cool accessories that accompany this watch. Um, this one is actually um, was produced in 1977. It was actually um, sold in December on December 12th of 78. And the reason why I know that is because 
I've got two archive extracts from Paddock. So pretty, pretty awesome. The watch went back in for a, a service and, and was reissued an archive extract. And then I've got the original archive extract as well here. So this one's from 2006 and this one's from uh, 2015. So the watch actually went back to Patek a couple different times for just general service and things like that. So there's actually some pretty good history on this watch, um, which you know is really, really awesome. The other thing that's really cool is that we actually have an original Nautilus cork box. So these boxes are insanely, insanely rare. Um, this one actually includes its original, uh, you know, fold over insert here. And then it also, you know, is in really, really good condition. These cork boxes were either discarded or they had a tendency to kind of like crumble apart. And essentially the box is like this, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, like a pressed cork essentially. Uh, and so these boxes, much like the watches themselves, have become insanely desirable by the collector community. Um, matter of fact, a, a box, just the cork box, believe it or not, is trending upwards of 18 to $25,000 just for the cork box. So this box alone is worth 18 to $25,000, um, just the box, no watch. Uh, the 3700 pricing over the past few years has definitely uh, increased. Um, finding a good example like this is basically impossible to, to do. They do come up, but very rarely in the in the private market. Um, you'll see them at auctions and things like that. A watch like this, uh, in my professional opinion, would trade at around 135 to 140,000 um, with the box and the extracts and the service history and all that kind of stuff. I would say a, a soft example would definitely be pushing, you know, high 90s um, into the about a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and we're filming this in you know 2020 in October of 2020. So um, these are watches that are definitely not decreasing in value. The awareness of them is definitely increasing. I'm probably uh, in, not to give myself too much credit, but even talking about these watches and drawing attention to them. Um, they're, they're, you know, people are becoming aware and, and that's ultimately what is, you know, creating a demand and, uh, driving attention towards watches like this. So, um, a really interesting watch. I'm very excited to, and, and honored to have been able to share this one with you, um, as it's definitely what we would call a case study example for what the reference should look like, what the dial should look like, what the case should look like, uh, it has its box, it has its extracts, you know, full service history. This is definitely, uh, you know, a, a prime example for sharing. So um, as always, guys, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this one. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're not doing so already, follow us on Instagram at Craft and Taylor. And if you have watch questions, we're definitely here and happy to help. Drop us a line at info at craftandtaylor.com. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll see you in the next one.